Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Saliba, board member of Freeport Speech. Welcome to the fourth event of our 2023 season. Tonight's moderated panel discussion brings you the thinking and comments of three of Maine's great educational leaders. Each has left a legacy at the institutions that they led. Before introducing them, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Legacy Properties, Sotheby's International Realty. Its president and owner, Chris Lynch, is a proud graduate of Bates College. I also want to acknowledge our 2023 season supporters who've made this, season, this season's events possible. Their contributions have allowed us to focus on bringing you the highest level of speakers on timely topics. Finally, I want to thank the other board members of Freeport Speech. Without their hard work and guidance, none of this would be possible. Proceeds from tonight's event will be for the benefit of Freeport High School Scholarship Foundation. It was established to address inequities in post-secondary access among Freeport High School graduates. How appropriate given tonight's lecture. We hope that you will consider supporting this important fund. Uh, one final comment. As announced in tonight's program, we've added a seventh lecture, which will be on Thursday, November 16. We've been able to convince Dr. Nirav Shah, the principal deputy director of the 29,000 employee Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, to come back to Maine and speak on climate change and public health, what can we do? We still have, uh, we will have a limited number of tickets. It will be at Meeting House Arts and they'll go on sale a little early in September. Um, more details are on our website, freeportspeech.org. And I encourage all of you to get your tickets early. It is going to be um, a guaranteed sellout, even though it's a week before Thanksgiving. Leadership facilitates results, and tonight's speakers have demonstrated this throughout their careers. They are truly the best and the brightest. Now, I've made a decision. I have five more pages of description about each of our speakers in total. I've decided their time and their speaking is far more important than my sitting here. I will tell you this. Amongst the four people at the table, Glenn Cummings, Clayton Spencer, Bro Adams, and Renee Landers, from my left to right, there are two Phi Beta Kappas, two Magna Cum Laudes, one Summa Cum Laude, and 14 degrees. <laughs> 14 degrees. Um, it's a little bit intimidating and awe-inspiring. They, I meant what I said about legacies. Uh, what Bro did at Colby, what Clayton has done at Bates, what Glenn did at the University of Southern Maine is just amazing. Please join me. I left off one other thing. All four had presidential appointments. All four individuals on the panel tonight and our moderator, Renee Landers, were appointed by either President Clinton, President Obama, or others to, um, to um, amazing positions in Washington, yet each came back to Maine. Um, Renee is from Watertown, Massachusetts, but tonight we're making her an honorary Mainer and any time that she comes back to Maine, she's one of us. So I'm not gonna go any further than that. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Renee, and the panel. Um, I'd be glad if anybody would like some of the information to email you later on. I really did prepare an awful lot, but thank you all. Good evening.
Well, good evening, and thank you very much, Tom, for that really very kind introduction. I should say that I kind of have a, a few main roots because my mother-in-law spent all of her summers in uh, an area just outside of Brunswick, I think it's outside of Brunswick, called Pennellville. And um, she, um, she spent all of her summers there as a child. And uh, so we've been up here you know, sometimes with her trying to kind of recreate that magic that she experienced. So Maine is definitely um, you know, part of our family's, um, family's lore. Um, I want to thank, um, I know the panelists will join me in thanking uh, Freeport Speech and its sponsors for convening this conversation uh, this evening. Um, all former presidents of Maine institutions of higher learning really create a distinguished panel um, <clears throat> who will be able to um, actually respond probably to your questions really quite effectively because they understand our audience. I also want to thank um, all of you for being here this evening, for taking time from your busy schedules and from your vacations uh, to be here. And as Tom already said, given the topic that um, proceeds will benefit the Freeport High School Scholarship Foundation is certainly fitting. Um, I, I think it's great to note at the beginning also that Glenn Cummings, the former president of the University of Southern Maine, uh, agreed to, he uh, was originally going to be uh, you know, an introducer this evening, but he uh, graciously changed his role uh, because Barry Mills uh, could not be here. Um, and that given um, that diversity in higher education is our topic, having someone who represents the perspective of public universities, I think is really uh, important and wonderful addition to the discussion this evening. Um, Clayton Spencer and I um, started working at the Boston, a Boston law firm the same fall. So I have known Clayton for a very long time. And she will bring many years of uh, experience in Harvard's administration, as well as having been president of Bates College to this discussion. And finally, uh, Bro Adams has the view of college and uh, university operations and admissions from two different presidencies, one at Bucknell and then at Colby College. So uh, as you all know, the reason that we are here this evening is because on June 29th, the United States Supreme Court announced its decisions in Students for Fair Admissions uh, versus the President and Fellows of Harvard College and the companion case involving the University of North Carolina. The court implic uh, implicitly overturned decades of precedent and held that two institutions, the two institutions, violated the 14th Amendment and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by impermissibly considering the race of individual applic applicants as a factor in their undergraduate admissions processes. The court reaffirmed that the obligations of government entities under the 14th Amendment and of private entities receiving federal funds under Title VI are the same. Chief Justice Roberts, in the majority opinion for the court, reaffirmed his tautology from a 2007 decision involving uh, public K-12 education when he, he wrote that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it. Notably exempted from this blanket prohibition are the United States military academies. We can talk about that and the reasons for that later. Uh, the court examined the Harvard goals, which he said were similar to UNC's, and the goals are training future leaders, preparing them for an increasingly diverse society, better educating them through learning alongside students with diverse backgrounds and outlooks, and producing knowledge with the catalyst and confluence of those diverse outlooks. Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the majority rejected um, these historically allowed justifications for race-based decision-making and admissions. And he, in doing so, he applied um, the court-created doctrine of strict scrutiny. That doctrine requires that the use of race in any government decisions must serve compelling governmental interests and if, if, it's, if, if it identifies a compelling governmental interest, the practice must be narrowly tailored or necessary to achieve those interests. Ro uh, Roberts noted that the goals of the institutions were commendable, but concluded that they cannot be subjected to meaningful judicial review because they are, quote, not sufficiently coherent, they are standardless, they are imprecise in many ways, 
and plainly overbroad. Those are all his language, not mine. Race, he said, may never be used as a negative and cannot reinforce stereotypes. And so he also criticized the use of race um, for lacking any, quote, logical endpoint to help determine when the use of race is no longer necessary. Justices Sotomayor and Jackson filed dissents, taking on the majority's vision of the Constitution and the society it regulates. This is from uh, Justice Sotomayor's opinion. The court cements a superficial role, rule of colorblindness as a constitutional principle in an endemically segregated society where race has always mattered and continues to matter. The court subverts the constitutional guarantee of equal protection by further entrenching racial inequality in education in the very foundation of our democratic government and pluralistic society. And she also took issue with the court's analysis of the history of the adoption of the 14th Amendment, calling the majority's pan to colorblindness a rhetor rhetorical flourishes disassociated from the actual history. Justice Jackson, who only decided the North Carolina case because of her role as a, uh, in serving on the Board of Overseers at Harvard, wrote a dissent where she stated that our country has never been colorblind with, and this is, you've probably read this quote in the newspapers, with let them eat cake obliviousness today, the majority pulls the ripcord and announces colorblindness for all by legal fiat. But, she goes on, deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. Uh, she then goes on to say, have, and having so detached itself from this court's actual past and present experiences, the court has now been lured into interfering with the crucial work that UNC and other institutions of higher learning are doing to solve America's real world problems. So, um, one of the, uh, distinguishing features of this case from the case that was very controversial from last year, the uh, Dobbs against uh, Jackson Women's Health Organization case, which overturned the federal constitutional protections for abortion, is that um, uh, the opinion polls indicate that most Americans disapprove of the use of race in college admissions. Now, there's a very um, thoughtful piece that's in the July issue in Harvard Magazine by Lincoln Kaplan who attributes some of this opposition to the, quote, sustained public relations campaign against affirmative action that he says has occurred. Um, but the two cases are similar in the reliance of the majority opinions on slices of, his, of the historical record to create a narrative with which the dissenters then have their own counter historical narrative. So to frame our discussion, um, of what the opportunities are for college and uniformity, uh, university admissions today. Um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, Harvard's new president, Claudine Gay, said that she um, wanted uh, colleges and universities to continue to be able to value diversity. And so the, one of the challenges of our conversation tonight is to try to figure out how that can continue to occur and how universities and colleges may pivot in all their work um, to uh, continue with those missions. So Clayton, after that background, <clears throat> you're a lawyer, as I already indicated, as well as a college leader. Why is the Students for Fair Admission against Harvard UNC case so important? Well, I think we first have to ask, is it important? And I'll, I'll give the punchline now and say <laughs> it's very important, I think. Um, but I think it's our job to convince you of why it's an important case, regardless of what you feel about the, the individual issues involved. Um, one of the reasons it's important is because of the context of this case. You'll notice that this case is focused on higher education, specifically the admissions processes at two very selective institutions. And by very selective, we mean they have a lot more applicants than they could possibly admit. So something has to happen in the filter there. Um, so education, so, so education has been a battleground for civil rights since very memorably, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, when uh, Thurgood Marshall basically said, you can't have segregated public schools. Our 
the children in this country entitled to the same educational experience, separate is inherently unequal. And in that case, he overruled um, a line of jurisprudence that dated back to the 1890s and um, that said you could have separate facilities, separate teachers, et cetera. It was called separate but equal. It was upheld. So we've already been through a period where we had the Civil War, a brief, brief moment of reconstruction, and then everything got clamped down again in a conservative court until 1954. I'm, I'm going through this because it's, it's important to how the justices view this particular case. 1954, and I'm not going case by case, only one more case. Um, 1978, the logic of, um, of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which was part of the iconography of the civil rights movement, black children trying to enter white schools over massive resistance in the South. Um, 1978, the question gets to the level of higher education in the Bakke case where a white applicant to the University of Davis um, Medical School in California sued fighting the quota that the quota system they had for admission there, which was they had 100 slots for medical students, 16 were, were, were to go to students of color. And in that case, the Supreme Court said the quota system is not okay, not, not, we're never gonna do that, but in the context of holistic admissions, of, of admissions process that considers many factors involving the whole person, um, race can be one factor. It can't be the winning factor. It can't guarantee results. It can be one of many factors used in a limited way. And that, that was based on an amicus brief filed by Harvard. Ironically, the system that just got struck down was the system that was lifted up in that case. That was 1978, and for the 45 years since then, um, there have been several challenges, most notably in Texas and Michigan, that have once again tried to get the court to rule on the question of whether a limited consideration of race is permissible to achieve diversity in higher education. It, it, it has hung on sometimes tenuously until this case, which was decided on June uh, 29th, 2023. So, why is education the battleground or an important battleground? Because education is the gateway to the opportunity structure in the United States. Um, I think we all know from how interested we are in our own children, our grandchildren, our own life experiences, it's, it's a uniquely powerful experience. I don't mean going to a, a selective institution, I mean, figuring out what you need educationally, having the opportunity to fulfill that. It's uniquely powerful for the individual and it's very powerful for society. It's hard to run a democracy if you don't have citizens who can read and be informed about the issues. It's hard for individuals to have good job prospects, careers, access to health care, ability to navigate health care, the ability to have an income that can purchase a house and help them build some equity, and hopefully the ability to have some money to save for their retirement and to pass on to their kids. So it is key to the opportunity structure in this country. So that's why there is a lot at stake. And if you think about the emotion even you may have felt about education the chances, the process, whatever, of your own children going to college, that will make some kind of sense. So what does this opinion do? Um, I'm just gonna lift up one thing, which is the essence of the way Roberts decided the case in, for the majority. And the majority was the case decided 6-3, as Renee said. So the case focused on Harvard and UNC, as we've established, and the question before the court was whether colleges may consider race as one of many factors in a holistic admissions process. You'll hear more about the admissions process from Bro. Um, another way of saying it, are, is, 
are race-conscious admissions practices permitted under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which states that no, no state shall deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. As you've heard, the majority says no, it's not constitutional. And that's because of Robert's view of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. He basically says, and Renee began to get into this, if you use race as a factor, even if it's one of many factors, the, uh, the other things, a basket of factors, if, it, if you use it at all, you're creating a plus factor. And a plus factor given to one applicant because of race, not given to all other applicants, is a penalty and a negative to others. So if you give it to one, you're denying something of others. Um, and he, he basically says that the essence of the, um, of the Equal Protection Clause is that um, the, the core purpose of the clause is doing away with all governmentally imposed discrimination based on race. So he does not distinguish discrimination like the Jim Crow laws in the South that said don't even bother applying to a college, you're not going to get in anywhere down here from gosh, we better do something to make sure we open up the educational system. So it's, it, it's race, it's per se, and you can't do it. The dissenters um, had the opposite view, or a, a very different view. Um, they see the 14th Amendment not as just being about a constraint on what government can do, but about a purposeful, substantive goal, which is to guarantee equality to all citizens on an equal basis. And they spend an enormous amount of time on the historical context because the 14th Amendment was passed after the Civil War. Um, it was passed the Senate in 1866. It became ratified in, into the 14th Amendment in 1868. And it, they had to do it because there was such resistance in the South which was trying, after the Civil War, to reimpose black codes that prevented all sorts of equal access. So in the hands of the dissenters, the 14th Amendment is highly substantive. So I'm going to stop there for now. I, there are specifics about what colleges can and can't do after this case, but we can get to that in a minute. Right. So I think that um, you know, Clayton has set this up very well about you know, sort of what the tension is in seeing the operation of the 14th Amendment. <clears throat> and just to do the lawyer nerd thing, the law professor nerd thing, the, um, the, the reason that um, Harvard, even though it's not a government entity, gets swept into this is because um, it receives federal funds and Title VI, the statute, um, the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, um, states, uh, you know, essentially um, parrots the language of the 14th Amendment that any um, entity receiving federal funds, uh, federal financial support, uh, cannot discriminate on the basis of race. Um, so, and you know, in this day and age for any use of university to um, disavow federal funds would be a very problematic enterprise financially. Um, all right, so um, as Clayton said, um, the Bakke case, the 1978 case where um, uh, in Justice Powell's opinion, um, which uh, you know, uh, you know, really sort of uh, identified uh, from Har the, brief, the amicus brief that Harvard filed in the case, uh, this idea of a holistic admissions process, uh, where and Justice Powell described it as the applicant saying that the applicant who loses out on the last available seat to another candidate receiving a plus on the basis of ethnic background will not have been foreclosed from all consideration for that seat simply because he was not the right color or had the wrong surname. So, bro, now I'll turn to you, having uh, seen uh, multiple college admissions processes at work. Um, do, do the processes that Clayton described, that you know, Justice Roberts described, and that Justice Powell described, you know, how do they sit with, or how do you see them? Do they describe any admissions process that you're familiar with? Sort of. <laughs> uh, thank you, Renee, for um, the work you did bringing this panel together. And thanks to Tom. I'm not sure where Tom is, but thank you, Tom, <clears throat> for the invitation. This is an enormously important 
topic. I was rereading the decisions uh, this morning and the dissents this morning, and it came back to me in a very powerful way how significant this decision is and what hugely important consequences it will have down the road. And I say that not just because, as Clayton said, college is and university experience is fundamental to the way this economy works, to the way the society works, in, re in ways that, that you all understand, but because this decision is a kind of window, I think, into the evolution of race relations in this country and has enormously important ramifications for that topic now and I think for decades to come. So that's, in a sense, why we're all here. Um, there's a lot of talk in the decision, as some of you know, about the actual process of admissions, both at Harvard uh, and at Chapel Hill. And it's a topic that I think is not particularly well represented in the decisions, frankly, uh, but is not very well understood publicly. And I thought I might just spend a minute remembering and recalling my own uh, experience with these processes that we've all had here at the table. Uh, building a class in a college or university, particularly in a highly selective college and university, is a very complicated, very multifaceted, and imprecise process. It's basically a process, as I think back on it, of balancing a whole uh, cluster of institutional priorities, aspirations, ambitions, and values as each decision is made. And it is never perfect. In fact, it is very far from perfect. And I remember at the end of those processes every year, and I'm sure the rest of us remember too, the holes that were left in the process, the disappointments, the, uh, the problems, the challenges that remain after all of this work and looking ahead to the next year and the subsequent years, how can we do this better? The balancing occurs between and among, first of all, what I'd call demographic considerations and priorities. What is the geographical spread of the student body or the admitted class? What is its diversity? A topic that came became, of course, incredibly uh, important to institutions over the last several decades. Uh, what is the gender balance of, uh, of the class? Some of you know that in liberal arts colleges such as Bates and Colby and Bowdoin, um, it has been increasingly difficult to arrange a class that has gender balance. It will not surprise some of you to know that women, young women, are outperforming young men in high school and in the admission process in very, very substantial ways. And so gender was a concern and is a concern, I think, for all of these competitive institutions. It's just an example of one of the priorities, one of the mixes, one of the um, areas in which the admission process is very complicated. There are very important programmatic considerations that affect the admission process. All of our institutions are trying to ju juggle a very, very complicated curriculum. I, I don't know how many majors there were at, at Bates, but there were something like 36 at Colby when I was there. You're trying to make sure that students are spread across the curriculum in rational ways, that you don't end up, as Stanford has ended up, with 70% uh, of their students going into computer science. That's just not the way that these institutions um, can operate. So there's a very complicated curricular and academic program balance that you have to strike. There's an array of talents and special interests that we want to see reflected in the student body. The famous example that comes up in the Supreme Court cases is the oboe player. But there are many different versions of that when you think about a college class, the curriculum, the program, the things we want students to be able to do and to do well uh, when they're in college. Another one that is coming up now, and I hope we'll maybe have a chance to talk about it, is athletics. In Colby's class, of the last class that I, I saw admitted at Colby, 
of about 480 students. There were roughly 140 recruited athletes. That is to say, these are students who have been identified by coaches as having highly desirable athletic skills. Recall that a place like Colby, Bowdoin, Bates has an athletic program of 32 intercollegiate varsity sports, all very competitive, all in a very competitive athletic conference. So there was a great deal of pressure, competitive pressure, to succeed in those programs, and that meant recruiting athletes. It also meant giving admission advantages to roughly 80 of those 130 athletes. That is to say, 80 students out of a class of 470 would not have been admitted but for their athletic talents. We can come back to that topic uh, perhaps in, in conversation. There are competitive pressures in the admission process uh, coming largely now from these competitive rankings. US News and Real Report is the most onerous and the most um, detestable in my view. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it, it's, it's a factor in the admission program. Uh, colleges receive or are under pressure to have very high average SAT scores. That's starting to, to dissipate now because a lot of institutions aren't doing SATs anymore. But in my time, that was a really serious issue, as were things like class rank. All of these things become part of the class as it's represented externally. And so they play a role, subtle sometimes, but a role of pressuring certain kinds of decisions in certain ways. There are other considerations, and the two of the most important are legacies. You're going to be hearing a lot about that now and in the future around this case. That is to say, the children of alumni of these institutions, and remember these institutions thrive in many ways, because of the very active involvement of alumni in the life of the institution. So it's not a trivial thing to um, consider those children of active alumni, given the realities of how these institutions are funded, given uh, that their health, their health in economic terms and in other terms, has a lot to do with the engagement of alumni. That is now going to come under enormous pressure but it's the case that at most of our institutions, legacies, so-called legacies, had in some cases admission advantages. The other hugely important fig fig uh, aspect of the admission process, last and not least, but it's enormously important, is the ability of students to pay. Notwithstanding the enormous endowments that places like Colby and Bates and Bowdoin and Harvard, the, the mother load of endowments, <laughs> Um, notwithstanding the size of those endowments, almost no institution in this country, excepting Harvard and a couple of other places, can afford not to consider the financial circumstances of the students they admit. There's an enormous amount of financial aid at Colby and other places like it, Bates, Bowdoin, among them, but there's never enough. So another big factor in the admission cycle is finding that balance where the financial aid meets as much need as possible, but doesn't go over the edge and put the institution in some kind of uh, financial risk. Hovering over all of these things, it was always fundamentally important, including the diversity issue, to know that students could succeed. These are very competitive places. Um, the classroom is a lively, rich, complicated, competitive place, and we had to have confidence that every student admitted would succeed, irrespective of their background, irrespective of what other uh, factors they bring uh, to the institution. And that also had to do with student motivation and our ability to read student motivation. Finally, ending with the question of diversity, um, the institution, our institutions, I'm sure Bates, I'm sure others like it, were indeed aspiring to have many, many more students from diverse backgrounds that had historically been the case at our kinds of places. Remember that these institutions were themselves discriminatory for most of their histories. 
with respect to women, with respect to students from underrepresented groups. And so it became an aspiration of the institutions to remediate that history and to develop systems of admission and systems of recruitment that would make those institutions look more like the surrounding society than they had been before. That was not a mechanical, quota-driven process, but it was a very clear aspiration to push the boundaries of what we had been doing in the past and to make our places fundamentally accessible to students who could succeed from all backgrounds, against the background of discrimination and exclusion that had been the case for a very long time in our kinds of places. I'm going to stop there. Very helpful um, to have that kind of insight. As I hear us discussing all these things, I, I received um, a call from a reporter for the Harvard Crimson a few weeks ago, and she would she reminded me that it was the 50th anniversary of the merger of the admissions offices at Harvard and Radcliffe. And why was she calling me? Because as a freshman, I had been on the committee that made the recommendation to the university that the admissions offices should be merged. And we were having these conversations. Um, what will it do to um, alumni loyalty if we're not taking as many men? Should we expand the size of the college so that we can have the same number of men but just add women? Um, none of those things happened. And we correctly guessed that fathers would be just as proud to support their daughters for admission to Harvard and Radcliffe as they were their sons, and that has seemed to work out. But um, anyway, it's just sort of interesting that we keep having to have these same conversations about um, equity and inclusion in these processes. All right, so um, the um, Clayton, I'm going to mention this since Clayton brought up the uh, Bakke case and the um, you know admission to medical school. Um, the Association of American Medical Colleges, which is the association of all the, Amer uh, the medical schools in the United States, the accredited medical schools, has been filing uh, uh, religiously amicus briefs in all of these affirmative action cases that um, Clayton outlined. And um, there's one statistic in every, or at least the two most recent iterations of that brief, where the schools point out that um, if they, um, they you know, of all the applicants to medical school in whatever the reference year is, some percentage between 10 and 15 percent of applicants with perfect MCAT scores and GPAs are rejected at every medical school to which they apply. Now, some of it may have to be because they were kind of overreaching where they were applying to, but some of it might be because that's just not the only thing, right, that medical schools are looking for when they're looking at applicants. So the Harvard class of 2019 was the last set of statistics that the Supreme Court considered in, the, um, in this recent uh, decision. That year, um, the college received 30, uh, well, of the, in the admission cycle for that year, the college received 35,000 applications, planned to admit 2,000, and expected 1,600 to accept admission offers. 8,000 applicants had perfect GPAs, 3,400 had perfect math SAT scores, and 2,700 had perfect verbal SAT scores. So therefore, Harvard, trying to get to that 2,000, uh, considered about 15,000 fully qualified for admission. So the question for you, Glenn, is do these Harvard data reflect the situation of most colleges and universities, or is this focus a little bit elitist and kind of misguided, given you know, what the rest of the country is like? Um, and um, should we, you know, should we broaden the lens here a little bit and talk more uh, uh, broadly about higher education in the United States? Well, uh, thank, thank you very much, Renee. Is my speaker on? Yes, yes. Okay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great preparation, uh, Renee, and thank you for uh, uh, Freeport's speech, for the, the board members and sponsors that made this happen. I feel a lot of pressure today because I'm responsible now. There are, there are 15.6 million undergraduates, and 3% of them go to schools like these guys. So I have to represent 97% of the undergraduates uh, here. Uh, I can do it. I, I don't know. Okay, there you go. 
<laughs> this is the problem with academics, right? <laughs> Um, let me just say that, uh, yeah, if I can answer that directly, of course they're elitist schools. They brag about being elitist schools. Let's just say that, right? We reject, I mean, you know, Bro was rejecting one in eight at Colby, and his predecessor came in and fired the admissions director and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to reject one in 10, right? So, 10, or 10, out of, uh, 10 to one. So the game they're in is rejection. Why does that matter? Why does that matter here? First of all, it matters because in 1984, something very, uh, very threatening to our national security happened that nobody really talks about. There was a, for World War II, all the way up into the mid-1980s, America was number one in college attainment. And then this one little country, not a major threat to us, named Canada, slipped by. And since that time, 15 other countries have slipped by in major ways. We have effectively, since 1984, been stuck at approximately 38%. We, at the Obama administration, I take this personally for our failure and my failure, we moved it all the way to something like almost 41%, and we are stuck. The Canadians, the Germans, the Australians, the Japanese, supposedly the Russians, we're not sure we trust their data, uh, the French, they're closer to 50 and 55%. This is a national security issue. Colby, Bates, Bowden can't help us with that by definition. By definition, they can't help us with that. The other 97% of us have to be important enough, good enough, and effective enough in getting students, or we have a major problem of national security in this country, and the future is at stake. That's why I argued at USM, somewhat obnoxiously, but bro was always gentle about this. We are the most important university in America. Now, we're not the only most important university in America, but if the American dream is going to come true, it has to come true in the other 97%, because you're not letting in most of the people, and now you can't even let in people with a major argument to be let in, which is the history of really torture, rape, and child trafficking that we use for 400 years on this continent to maintain white control. So now we have it even more restricted. And so when we think about what are we gonna do next, we have to ask the question, well, let me just take a little piece of the irony of the Supreme Court case. If you talk about national interest, they said, you know, we're gonna do a carve out for the military academies because it is a compelling national governmental interest to carve them out. Why? Because they know that in order to build the kind of internal institutional society that a military needs, you have to have an a understanding of people who are different from you. And it's essential to our national security. This is argued by Roberts himself. And so when we think about the future of where higher education needs to be, we say, let's look at, and, and I think thank you for both Bro and, and Clayton for doing this, what can you consider? You, consider? you can consider whether your rich uncle went to that school. You can consider whether you can play squash really well. You can consider whether you can play golf really well. You can consider whether you're in the top 1%. Remember. Princeton, Brown, Yale, Penn, Dartmouth have more elements of their student body that are in the top 1% than the bottom 60%. Bottom 60% is about $70,000 a year, and the top 10% is now over 700, the top 1% is now over 700,000 income per year. And so places and that I mentioned, if I can pick on Colby, forgive me, bro, but in 2017, 20% of Colby undergraduates came from the top 1%. 11 came from incomes under 70,000. Now that doesn't mean he wasn't giving great financial aid, but when you think about what the, what the actual impact of you're allowed to look at, consider income in your choices, and what's happening is, by definition, it's a business. You have to find ways in which you can then pay those bills and what you perceive as those bills. 
So finally, what else can you look at? You can look at internships in Antarctica or Rotterdam, The Hague, that are paid for by your parents. What percentage of American parents can pay for internships like that? So now we know who's going to get into those schools and who's not by definition. And you can now perhaps not talk about adversity. Because in this opinion, Roberts goes after it and says, don't try to sneak around the race issue by doing something indirect. Don't try to sneak around it by saying, talk to us about your experience growing up and look for implicit ways to cite race, because it will come after you in another court case. So now it's not even clear that you can use adversity inventories to necessarily do it if it leans towards or bleeds over into issues of race. So what happens now? And by the way, one of the great ironies of the things that we talked about is what we can't talk about. We can't talk about race. We created race. Uh, whites can trade, created race in order to maintain an economic system that advantaged whites with enormous amount of cruelty and a long tail of implication. So what has happened in terms of going back to Renee's question, what has happened? Why do we need the public universities or the non-select universities? Remember, 90% of students today are attending universities where 60% or more of the students were accepted. At USM, I used to say, we're not a no school. And I was proud of this. We're a not yet school. Maybe you need to go to the community college. Maybe you need to get better uh, English as a second language training. Maybe you get to get better math skills. We want you here, but you're not quite ready to succeed here. We're a not yet school. So when you think about where are we going to go as a country, now we've restricted it even more. And the irony of restricting out race is, is that after we've used it for 400 years to white advantage, now that it might potentially work against us, we flip the rules around and say, no, 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 you can't use that. When we have an opportunity to make up for the lack of educational attainment in black America. So I'll stop right there, but that's my thoughts. Thanks. So one of the, um, uh, Michael Bloomberg, do you remember him? He, um, he had a piece uh, in, in, surprisingly, Bloomberg, the publication, uh, Bloomberg uh, Law that he runs, where um, he talked about this issue of the role of um, the non-selective universities, the not yet there yet, the not, not, the, you know, not the admissions processes of no, and the importance of them. And this was just last week. And um, you know, after he discussed the situation that um, Glenn just described, he concluded by saying an applicant's race is usually irrelevant in admissions decisions in these processes because most of the applicants are going to be admitted. So, um, so let's talk about some of these things that, um, that maybe colleges and universities can use now. Um, one of the, um, you know, the reason that Chief Justice Roberts put that line in the uh, opinion about how, well, nothing in this opinion should be construed as prohibiting universities from considering an applicant's discussion of how race affected his or her life, be it through discrimination, inspiration, or otherwise. He, the reason he put that in the opinion, I think, is because of the oral argument. And I, you know, I, for a living, I teach constitutional law, so I listen to the oral argument sometimes. Um, as the college, um, uh, he, he, in the uh, oral argument, Justice Jackson posed a hypothetical to a lawyer for students for fair admission, and she discusses this hypothetical in the dissent in the case. Essentially, in the hypo, she asked whether the university could consider the multi-generational UNC affiliation of a white applicant, a legacy, who was a descendant of a slave-owning North Carolina faculty, uh, family. And the lawyer answered yes. Justice Jackson then asked whether the university could consider the status of a black descendant of enslaved persons also long resident in North Carolina. And the answer, the lawyer answered no, because the reference to enslavement would be a pretext for race, for using race. So I think Roberts sort of felt compelled to add that line in the opinion 
um, because that just seemed like an absurd result, right? Uh, and so, um, so anyway, so let's talk about um, what the kinds of criteria are that can be used. In this Fisher case that um, Clayton mentioned, the court approved of a Texas law that required the UT programs to accept the top 10%, I think it's now, my students tell me, the top 7% of graduates from every high school class in Texas. Uh, and, but, of course, um, to produce a racially diverse class, this sort of system relies on segregated high schools serving highly segregated communities. So, um, so that's one methodology. Um, what, about, what are some of these other methods? Glenn referred to some, but um, maybe you all could talk about the kinds of things that maybe you'd like to see universities use. So, okay. go ahead. Yeah. So can I just say what, what the decision has left us with, and then we can talk about okay. where we may go from here. So it's interesting that in this complete reversal U-turn on sort of the doctrine of how educational opportunity fits into the concept of racial equity in, in this country, um, the, the court didn't touch the following things. It is still a totally fine goal to want to have a diverse student body. It just can't be pursued with an explicit racial means. Number two, you can go out, this, this case does not rec uh, touch outreach and recruitment. You can go out and go to places and know, and absolutely explicitly go to places that have students of a wide variety of backgrounds and you can recruit hard, you can send the mailings, you just have to do it in a system which is already done anyway where you're also reaching out to other students in similar ways. Um, you can still run all the support services that you run now to for, for all students. I mean, this is, all students need support, expect support, parents expect support. We've, we're living in an anxious time with this generation. Um, you can run all of those things. You can have equity and inclusion offices. You can, you can actually, according to, uh, Roberts, you can still use demographic data. Now the problem with, and, and then you consider essays. They, he didn't try to regulate what a student could write on an essay, and they're just open writing opportunities in an application. What you don't want is a checkoff box for race, and that's gonna be suppressed in the common app. The students can apply to multiple institutions through one application. They will have, they will ask, institutions now if, if you if you want to suppress that and you probably should your lawyers will tell you you should so that you can't just have a check off at the time of the committee so there's a lot still there the weird part is that the clearly the most effective thing which is straightforwardly to consider race which has a huge impact on people's life experiences and that's what we're trying to figure out they're taking out that one factor out of a constellation of things that um, Glenn and Bro characterized quite brilliantly that massively privileges white students. So you take out the one thing and then you have the very awkward situation where you can read an essay, find out that this, this student um, has overcome adversity and he, can, he or she, they can talk about their race. Um, but then do you have to like forget that student when you get it into the committee room? It's, it's, it's bizarre, it's contorted. And um, so, those, so a lot is left intact, just the close in the deal is not. Yeah, it's, it's, gonna be, um, it's gonna be very difficult. I, I'm glad I'm not <laughs> responsible uh, for the process now. The, as many of you know, the, 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 the results in other states, California, Texas, have been very, very mixed, where uh, the question of race has been repressed. It was very mixed uh, in the University of California system, somewhat mixed in Texas. The experience is not one where it has been easy to find other criteria that will produce a diverse student body. And I predict that at places like ours, highly selective places, and Glenn is absolutely right about the very small number of people involved, 
very serious impact with respect to the outcomes, uh, I think it's going to be devastating uh, in terms of the goal of achieving representationally diverse student bodies. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, but I think it's going to be very, very hard. There's been a lot of talk about income and income-related measures and metrics which could help produce diversity. And economic and financial diversity is very important. But there's no more money. <laughs> there's no more financial aid. Financial aid may grow incrementally over time. It probably will. But there's no more money right away. Institutions like ours, like Glenn's, are not going to suddenly have more money to invest in students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds in the hope that that will produce diversity. And just to be specific on that, the, if you try to do substitute income or wealth um, and say that's where we'll, that will be a race neutral way to find these students, in the bottom, um, the bottom quarter of the income distribution, um, only 31% of those students are students of color. So you're still looking, you, you got to work your way through. It'd be very hard to figure that out. It's also, um, it's also difficult to think how you would try to run an income and wealth analysis of all these students applying to you. Um, so, the, well, well, so some of the suggestions on that point are, um, you know, t you know, taking, you know, the incomes and zip codes from which they're applying, uh, the zip code in which their high school is located, um, you know, the, you know, statistics, the data from states about the um, uh, the resources that are available to the high school, so that you know, the the suburban high school with a lot of resources. Uh, you know, the, the college can take that with a grain of salt, but, you know, really look at the kid from the school where there are no extras in the, in the school curriculum. So what, what about all those kinds of, and what about you, I noticed you, none of you have mentioned eliminating um, L, uh, the, the SAT or the ACT score or any of these kinds of things. So, so what about that? And what about, so some of the critics of the use of race say, let's just look at these objective criteria and pick a class that way. What about that? Well, the, the obvious answer is we we'll start with the SATs, which are shown consistently decade after decade to have major biases towards white middle class and, and upper middle class students. So that alone won't do it. Let me just go back to the larger question. If, if we think about where, and by the way, I just was looking at the BA data, and, and by the way, what a great, as a great website at Berkeley called belonging.berkeley.edu, racial disparities. And it's a report card from 1970 to, to 2020, and a whole bunch of uh, significant indicators around total wealth of a black family versus total wealth of a white family, about educational attainment, about uh, career opportunities, all the dis discrepancy, and it gives a grade, A, a through F, uh, on how we have done as a country since 1970, and it's, it's a great website. Let, let me just go back to that for just a second. So we have good news about what has happened, a little bit of good news, in terms of the attainment of, for black Americans to obtain BA. So in 1970, the discrepancy between uh, white and, and black in 1970 was, a, was significant. Today, it was actually, it was 4% uh, had uh, obtained uh, 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 BAs, and 27% of white Americans, had, so black Americans were at 4%, 27 white Americans. Today, that has re collapsed. There's been an eight-fold increase in the number of, of BAs for black Americans up, uh, uh, as measured in 2020. The reason I bring that up is that most of those successes didn't happen in the elite schools. Most of those successes happened at Kentucky State or University of Texas, uh, El Paso, or they happened at a community college that lent, then eventually made them way into a BA. And so when you think about where you want to put your investment as a country, it, 
the investment needs to be continuing to do what has been successful, reasonably successful, in investing in public schools where most of our students will go, where most black Americans will go, and making sure that there is a rich body of support systems there. Now, I would argue that's still woefully below what it needs to be. So if we're really serious, if the real question is getting into Bowdoin, Bates, and Colby, that's a slightly different question. It's not an unimportant one, but in terms of changing the demographics of America, you want to ask the larger question, where is it gonna happen? And it's not gonna happen there in any significant way. And what has to happen? So let me just give you a couple ideas. We know from research and from experiments, and we did this at USM, is that small groups, I think that's the book, when you take small groups of students and you create cohorts and you check in on them and you have advisors that are watching them tenaciously and you're constantly in contact and communication with them and with their professors and you have great advising, their percentage increase in retention and completion is enormous. We found gaps and when we started our Promise Scholars program, we were losing, on students of color, we were under 50% retention. Think about that. We're losing half our students by the end of their sophomore year. So we started these small cohort groups. We had to raise private money to do that. And they had, cohort, they had a single advisor. They had support financially, lots of communication. And that moved from around 49%, 48% to almost 89% for those students. There are over 100 students in that program. If we could replicate that across America, we could start really solving the access of, and, and, and uh, uh, the ability to get students through the, the BA. So I, I think that we, we can find ways to do these things. I think it is a, a question, and Bro's right, there's not a lot of money, there's not a lot of appetite to invest heavily in, in education, unfortunately, in the United States. But when you start looking at how you could do this, there are strategic ways to start moving us towards more completion, uh, more career acquisition, and, and more successful uh, BA attainment. So, um, so there are things that I think we can do in the larger picture. I, I'm not going to be able to solve the elite admissions problem tonight for you. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep thinking about it. <laughs> Oh, you looked like there was something you wanted to add to what... Um, oh, many things. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I completely agree with Glenn that the, the, the large problem of opportunity in the United States, which has so many ramifications now in the, in the, as we confront populism and, and lots of other problematic political and social developments, the, the, big, the big frontier, the big front is in public education, where... Uh, where it really counts and where the big numbers really are. The problem, of course, is that states have been retreating from funding public higher education, almost every state in the United States. Those institutions are becoming more expensive. On the private side, we're becoming way more expensive. So even as we need more financial aid, more access, and to find other ways of providing access to underrepresented minorities, we're running out of money. We don't have enough money. So there's underfunding on the public side. There's a price trajectory on the private side that's discomforting and, and problematic. And these are all coming together um, at this moment when there's turbulence and I would argue regression in race relations in the United States as well. Sorry, that's kind of a gloomy view, but. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm hope to end on an optimistic question. I want to leave some time for questions, but maybe maybe two more ideas we could talk about just briefly um, before we turn to the audience questions or comments. Um, one is, um, you know, obviously, you know, one of the the things that Glenn was talking about relate to um, you know the the pr the level of preparation students have coming into institutions of higher education now and i you know i teach you know at the totally the other end of this process in a law school 
uh, but there has been a tremendous increase in the investment in academic support programs, right? Because students come in with um, you know, a whole range of skills, some of them very well prepared, they know what the deal is, they know how to do their work, they know how to study, and other students have no clue. And so, um, so one problem I think is that we haven't talked about is what's going on in K through 12 education, pre-K through 12 education in the country, the tremendous inequalities that remain there, uh, and the similarly declining resources there. Is there something higher ed can do about that end of the problem? Because you have to deal with it when the students come to you. <laughs> yeah. Clayton, Clayton, yes. Well, I think the first thing we do is understand in our admission processes and in the way we run our own curricula now and our own teaching that kids are coming from very different, different kinds of backgrounds. And you have to look for ways in college to, cohorts are a big part, um, completely changing up the way you're teaching, and I won't go into it um, in, right now when we're, we're um, toward the end. But do I think uh, we've had very good s success when colleges have taken over public schools and run them? No. We've had some of those in Boston, and it's been ridiculous. So I think our ed schools are getting more sophisticated about, I mean, we don't go around and say teachers are born, not made anymore. You can actually train teachers. You can, there's all sorts of things going on in the, in the professional aspect of, of educating teachers, but um, I think K-12, um, A, it's, com it's virtually completely resegregated, um, and the resource differentials are huge, and um, I don't think, I don't think we, we're going to have snappy answers to that. I think it's much more of a public problem. I mean, it's a, a shared problem that we've all got to deal with. Yeah. Uh, so just, uh, you know, what's on the horizon here? So there's a, um, uh, a case that um, the, uh, the losing party just uh, applied for um, a petition for certiorari to the Supreme Court either Monday or Friday. I can't remember which it's called. Watch for this case. Coalition for T uh, Thomas Jefferson. It's Coalition for TJ versus Fairfax County School Board. And Thomas Jefferson as a... a Science High School um, in Virginia, uh, very uh, very elite high school, um, similar to you know the one the elite high school that I'm familiar with, which is Boston Latin School. You know, also, TJ is also one of the oldest public high schools in the country. Um, its student body in 2019 was um, almost 72 percent Asian American, 19.5 percent white. And black, Hispanic, multiracial students comprised the remaining 9%. Many years, there were only one or two black students in the entering class. This is in the state of Virginia, right? So um, the county changed the admissions process. Also, the admissions process in, under that system involved taking a standardized test for which students had to pay $100 in order to take the test. So already, you've got this financial screening device for a public high school. So the school uh, changed their criteria. Uh, they um, uh, eliminated the fee for the test um, that 1.5% um, of each middle school's uh, uh, eighth grade class, uh, the top 1.5% is considered for admission. And admissions evaluators do not know the candidates' names, race, ethnicity, or sex. So the result of the change was that the class that was admitted that would graduate in 2025 is now 54% Asian American, uh, almost 8% black, 11% uh, Hispanic, 22% white, and then you know uh, some percentage, 5% of other. So what's the litigation about? The Asian American students, some of them, are very upset because there's no um, advantage to certain of the um, selective middle schools anymore. And the argument that they're making is that because the numbers of and the percentages of Asian Americans have dropped, that is evidence of discrimination against Asian Americans. So this presents a real conundrum, right? If the numbers have to stay the same, otherwise you're going to infer race discrimination. 
how can we ever change? Say, say one of the ironies, uh, there was a court case around the University of Texas, uh, Austin, in, uh, in which the University of Texas, uh, was a relatively elite school, was taking roughly the top 10% of every high school in Texas. And I, interestingly enough, it really worked in terms of race disparity for a very ugly reason. There were so many pockets of deep poverty in so many high schools. So for every high school in the state, if they took that top 10%, they ended up taking in large numbers of Latino and, and Afro-American students, which actually met the, and it was met by the, uh, at least the circuit, I don't, I don't remember if it was a Supreme Court decision, but that was upheld. And ironically, they were able to create an exceptionally diverse uh, 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 university, Ironic, but the, the, the problem with that is if you actually started to have more integrated communities, that would fall apart again. Uh, so, so maybe there's a, a way, at least in a temporary way, to use um, a strat of coming out of high school where you start to reward different communities and make sure from communities you could use that University of Texas case uh, to at least uh, why, why things are, you know, hopefully someday it will be less unequal, but for now your zip code seems to, to work, uh, in this case, to the advantage of the admissions process. The other thing that's happening is that universities obviously do other things besides admit students. So one of them, uh, among them are hiring faculty, hiring employees, um, perhaps um, operating DE&I um, programs, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs to make sure that you know everyone plays nicely together at work and under, really understands. I don't want to be you know flippant about this, but um, understands. And um, now um, the same organization, um, Edward Blum's organization, has now challenged some of the DEI programs at law firms, uh, financial services organizations, and there's a Massachusetts lawsuit. There was a pandemic relief program that um, gave advantages to women and minority-owned businesses because of past discrimination. And so owners of white businesses are now challenging that. So how do universities, is this, are, we, are universities just going to be kind of, you know, um, in the bullseye of targets for litigation until we get more guidance about all of these issues going forward? I think so. I mean, I, I um, and again, I'm, I'm glad I'm not <laughs> involved. But I, I think that this is just the beginning, and that uh, both on the employment side yeah. and on the admission side, there's going to be probing going on rather continuously now. I, I remember uh, uh, some very difficult correspondence I had years ago at Colby, right around the Grutter decision at Michigan. And I could tell there were people in that broad community that were just itching for a fight with the institution uh, with respect to its practices. And now the court has opened the door uh, to lots of different kinds of people with that animus. And as some of you know, colleges and universities have also been very aggressive on the employment side with respect to diversity. And I'm sure that those practices are going to come under uh, much tighter scrutiny now. Labor law has always been tighter, but I think it's going to be amplified now um, in the wake of this decision, and that universities are going to have to revisit all of their hiring practices. This is a gift certificate to lawyers, this case. Um, it, it, um, there's no framework laid out for what we're trying to do anymore, and there's no, well, if we're, you know, at least in, under the existing precedent, you were trying to create a more diverse and representative um, college experience across the country and open up educational opportunity. None of that is mentioned. There's no goal mentioned. There's just, you can't do it that way anymore. And, and um, there's no guidance to what we're trying to accomplish anymore. I don't think anybody wanted to say out loud, we're not trying to actually generate educational opportunity anymore. It's just you can't use this mechanism. So I think it is so opaque and in certain cases, places incoherent that I think it is a bonanza for lawyers, um, which I don't really consider myself anymore, but. <laughs>
So one, one last go around for the whole panel. Um, your, uh, your optimistic, one, one thing that makes you optimistic about the future. <laughs> well, I'll start. But um, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to, to uh, Clayton and Bro for their graciousness in letting me uh, torment them a little bit today. Um, they, they're always very classy they about it. So, but, it will happen. It'll happen. Um, I, I just think there are a couple of things that I would say are optimistic. If you actually look at those statistics uh, from Berkeley, there are some numbers of things that show trends in the right direction, and bachelor's degrees are perhaps the most important. The only caveat that I would give is one that I had to learn the hard way, is I was the, the master salesman for if you only got your BA, everything would be okay. And I, I was a master salesman because I'm a white guy and didn't know, even though I came from working class background, I didn't know how much that played out in the reality of my success as get, completing my BA. And I was straightened out by a young 21-year-old man from, uh, I think he was from Revere, Mass, who was at, at our school, University of Southern Maine, and he said, Dr. Cummings, I don't think you understand. 11% of the kids from Revere High School went on to college at all. I get here and all I see is white faces I don't know if I can stay in. Semester to semester, I don't have enough money. And if I do finally complete, I have a 50% less likelihood of getting a job than the white guy with the same grade point average and in the same profession. He said, it's not about equality and it's not that easy and just because I get my degree doesn't solve my problem as a black man in America. And that, that is a very, it changed my entire thinking as an educator and as an administrator. That's why we began the Promise Scholars Program. It's why we began to do things differently. I think we can continue to look at those realities, listen to those stories. That's why, by the way, why do we need those, those, those stories in higher education? To change people like me when I hear those stories. That's why this, this, this does, and forgive my, my insinuation that it doesn't matter in these elite schools, it really matters in these elite schools because you need to have other people listening to those stories. And that young man changed my thinking. And if he wasn't there, he would not have changed my thinking. So I think that if you look at those trends, they're actually more positive. There are things that you can do to make sure that they're successful in the long run. Clayton? I think our, our, our best hope is the creativity and the smarts and the means of production that the young people in this country have figured out how to use. And I just think of the impact of Hamilton on the way we think about Broadway, the, the impact of Bridgerton for those women in the audience. I bet you men were like, anything but that, please. Oh, where, no. <laughs> where, where Shonda Rhimes just, just exploded in one act the, the notion that certain kinds of people had to play each kind of role. And I think this court decision is seriously out of step with where we're going demographically. In, in the 18-year-old age group, it's already non-majority white. Um, and uh, our, our students have a lot of, I mean, our young people have a lot of confidence, a lot of power in their ability to broadcast their brilliant ideas. And um, that's always been the salvation in America, and I hope it comes through this time. Uh, well, just briefly, I, you know, most of my career in higher education was lived within the affirmative action era. All of it, really. And I saw how affirmative action and uh, aspiration toward diversity affected institutions I was involved with. And even though I think some of us looking back are a little disappointed in the long-term impact of those programs <laughs> against our early aspirations, I, I know that the places I've been involved with have been hugely committed uh, to that goal, and they still are. Uh, so I'm confident that all institutions, the, the, the big publics, the little publics, the big 
and little privates. This is just, this is a, a, a big, huge bump in the road, but I think institutionally across the United States, higher education is very committed to the notion of diversity, to equal opportunity, not simply as an educational value, but as, as the remediation of deep historical injustices. And I think that will continue. It's gonna to have to continue in a different way. So now it's your turn. Um, questions, and I, you know, I have these lights that are right blinding me in my eyes so I can't see hands. And I think there are microphones, are there microphones in the middle there for people to go to if they wanna ask a question? We could turn up the house lights. Yeah, maybe turn up the house lights. Yeah. Quick round rules and the questions, please. Uh, one question, no follow-ups. Now, by the way, you all know why I cut five minutes out of my introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we do have, we do have microphones. Just uh, raise your hand and the there mics will come to you. But again, please, one question, no follow-up. Hi, thank you. I'm curious if any of you went to public schools. I, went, I got my PhD from the University of California. Yay. <laughs> Tom, will you have to repeat the question? So yeah. Oh, yeah. The question was how many it, it, did any of us go to public schools? Undergrad. Undergrad. I have a question. Um, so and it's more for the uh, Bates and Colby. Uh, I'm, I'm the Bates grad that Tom mentioned earlier. Uh, so I know a fair amount about, about Bates. And, you, you were talking about filling the baskets, using you know, sports as an example, or music as an example. Is there any work going on to rationalize the baskets, or to change the mix of baskets to kind of come at it from the bottom up, versus having the baskets in place and filling them from the top down? Okay. Either one of you. But it's, you know, so I guess th there must be certain majors that, that attract different ethnicities or different racial backgrounds, or sports, different ethnicities, different racial yeah. backgrounds, or programs, is, is creating your basket by recreating your baskets. I think, it, I, I think higher education is famous for adding programs and not ever taking them away. Um, so basically, we just keep ending up with more baskets. Um, I think um, the economics of running super uneconomical majors that don't have, I, I mean, you have to make really hard decisions if you're gonna eliminate a sport or eliminate a department or anything, and that's, it is the existing collegiate experience, all the aspects of that that, that drive the economics and drive the basket filling. Um, I always felt like um, I, you know, I, I wasn't going to eliminate football on my uh, in, in my 11 years. I had 11 years to figure out how to do it. It wasn't going to happen, even though I don't know. Our, our winning streak was never great at Bates. Um, so I think it, it I think it's only actually happening in in cases of uh, financial extremity, frankly. But you're absolutely right. You've got, you're right on the money. That's what we need to be doing. I think you were also asking about whether shaping programs to attract greater diversity within the student body. Um, yeah, we certainly, we certainly talked about those kinds of things uh, from time to time. I wouldn't say that we got much traction on it. But, but I will say that there are certain... Um, there are public expectations or assumptions about certain programs in diversity that don't, in fact, aren't the case. For example, athletics. Uh, the athletic programs at Colby, at Bates, at Bowdoin, a lot of these other selected schools, the Ivies, are distinctly non-diverse. Uh, in fact, they, they some, in some cases, exacerbate some of those, some of those issues. Um, we did a lot of work Bates did, I know, Bowdoin did, and I know that in public institutions there has been a lot of work 
in trying to open fields to uh, underrepresented groups that have not been well represented in those fields, most notably in the sciences, for example. And the Mellon Foundation was very helpful in um, helping us help students see themselves, students from an underrepresented background, see themselves in these important fields in the academy and that are important in the economy and, and beyond as well. So we did a lot of work trying to uh, help students imagine their futures in ways that were not typical of uh, their backgrounds and where they came from and what their families had expected and so forth. And those were very powerful programs. It's, some of them are still going on. The Mellon program is, is a very well-known one, and it's still going on, but, but there were others. Um, um, thank you for, for this incredible uh, panel. Um, you talked a little bit about finances, but not a whole lot. And I can't help but think that that has a significantly large impact on what the discussion you're having, but also on the you know, decrease in quality of uh, education in the US. And you know, from my perspective, um, our government, our decision makers, don't make the investments that we need in the things that are really important. And I wonder what you think about that and how we can change some of those things. I work in public health, same thing in public health. No so, investment. So I, I actually have been thinking about it this because I'm way overdue on trying to write this response piece to an article that makes that very point that um, Historically, you know, we don't take the long view. There's always just very short-term thinking about all kinds of things like public health, education, and um, getting people to take the long view and make the required investments year after year after year um, is very difficult. I mean, you know, since we all just went through this horrible pandemic, right? And already, you know, we thought, well, you know, we won't have to argue about investment in the public health infrastructure anymore. Well everyone has lost interest, right? So um, I, I think that's, and then also if you think, if you compare, this is my, one of my other things, then I'll be, let my panelists respond. Um, we, there is, seems to be no amount of money that we won't invest in the prison system, right? Um, and a, a number of years ago now, this is back in the 80s, you know, Boston built a new jail for, you know, sort of uh, low level offenders. It was beautiful, it had a nice library, a nice gym. And then the, the Boston Globe did a photo essay about the jail in the public high school in Boston from which 80% of the people who were incarcerated in the jail had attended. You know, you really, really wouldn't even want to spend an afternoon in that building because it was in such bad shape. So how do we expect things to turn out differently if we won't make that longer term investment that will then not require us to make those significant investments in correctional facilities. It's a very, I think it's a very big problem for the country, personally. Now I'll shut up, I'm sorry, I just hijacked that question. I, I just say that um, one, one of, the, kind of the ethos of America is that we're not comfortable in what we perceive as anything that is a handout. So, so when we, when we think about Social Security, you earned it, right? And when we think about education, one of the powerful political arguments in education is it's a 50-50 bargain. You have to do the work to succeed in education. That's an individual deterministic, and there's a, there's a very strong uh, political bent in that direction. At the same time, there is a public interest and a public benefit there is a, a very well-aligned balance of community determination and self-determination. And I think the political argument can be made. I was there in the Obama administration the night that the health care package got passed. And we in the education department, many of us, were disappointed that President Obama decided to go all the way with Obamacare and not instead, as recommended by people like Rahm Emanuel and others, that it would have been politically more powerful to put those billions and billions of dollars into the Pell Grant. Now, it's just my bias because I'm not in healthcare, so forgive me, but, I, but what I'm trying to say is that politically, the Obamacare turned into an extremely difficult thing to ultimately keep defending. I believe that, I, that there was a great argument, probably to do both, is to put that investment in higher education and K through 12 education, but make the Pell Grant truly accessible for almost everybody in the country who needs it. 
really make college education truly affordable. And I think there is a great political argument, and I think the right and the left can come to, come to terms on that. And maybe I'm overly optimistic, but obviously spending does matter, uh, certainly on the right. But I do think there's an argument that it does balance those two needs, and there's a place to bring sensible people together in that pursuit, person. And do you think they get a tax rate that could fund that vision? I mean, that's, that's been a, a significant issue in the level of public funding for education for decades now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're talking about where's the money come from? Is that I'm just saying, we, 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 if you can't raise taxes, it's hard to do. Right. I'm not suggesting that I'm a huge advocate of raising taxes. I just think it's, that's a, that is a big part of the problem. So, but the Supreme Court has played a role here, too. So, um, Let's go back to you know 1954 and Brown versus Board of Education. So that was just a high watermark, and it was transformative for American society. I don't want to um, you know understate the significance of it. But then shortly thereafter, the Supreme Court decided, well, you can't have pie-shaped school districts. You know, coming from the inner city, you know, and out to the suburbs, which would have addressed the white flight problem in the wake of Brown. Uh, you can't do that because we can't show that all those school districts that might have been involved practiced a t intentional discrimination before. Um, the court has never said that education is a fundamental right. This is very important, very important, but it's never said that it's a fundamental right. Um, the court has, um, when, when um, school districts have been successfully sued and were under orders, court supervised orders, the court has um, cut them off before they actually had a chance to have sticking power, and the school districts, as soon as the court supervision was lifted, went back to their bad old ways of, you know, we'll build the high school in the nice suburb, suburb and um, underfund the inner city schools. Um, so, and then, you know, I don't know, we could have a whole different conversation about the um, Biden student debt forgiveness um, program. But, you know, notice the Supreme Court said, well, you can't use race, but you also can't forgive student debt, right, which has been an albatross because of the expense of higher education around, uh, you, know, uh, you know, really constraining the futures of a lot of young people. And, you know, we can have a long argument about what they agreed to and all of that sort of thing. But the court has played a role in making it difficult for the political actors to take some steps that might be helpful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to pull together a couple of threads that I would like your observations. The first is a, a thread that comes out of the work of uh, Angela Duckworth at University of Pennsylvania in her work on grit and her observation that the value of a college education normally was that it showed that you had the grit or the um, discipline to go through a long-term project to attain a goal. And that if you showed you could do that, that was a great determinant of your ability to succeed in life and therefore your, one of the values of education was to get to show that and to no surprise that people who got a college degree you know, did fairly well in life. Um, the second is the, some of the concept of Jay Forrester at MIT and the work of systems dynamics, that systems and structures determine outcomes. If you want a different outcome, you probably need a different structure or system. And I keep thinking about the third piece, which is that we now have the ability to do online courses, online education, and so on. And is one of the solutions here that I could get a degree in person at Harvard, or I could go and take the courses at Harvard online for less money and a faster time, and be able to, that way, open up to a broader group of people the ability to get an education. It may not be the same as being at the campus, but it might open up some of the things of the value of an education because fundamentally the elite schools are dealing with a supply-demand problem. There's way more demand than you have supply, and this might be a way to increase the supply and maybe take some of the pressure off. So I'd love to th hear some of your thoughts on this. Well, <clears throat> just to... Uh yeah, I, I, believe, I believe that grit's real. 
Um, but I, I, would, I would also say that as institutions of higher education, we've been trying to um, impart knowledge and also intellectual capacities. And I watched a lot of students discover their own grit, but I also watched a lot of students become much more capacious intellectually to develop knowledge and knowledge-related skills that were hugely important in, in the rest of their lives. So I, I wouldn't deny that that's a factor. I, I just think it's got to be accompanied by lots of other things. Um, I'm a skeptic when it comes to technology. I don't think, with respect to the educational experience that students have, that those that, that a remote experience or a highly digital experience is anything like the on-campus, in the presence of others experience that institutions we're talking about, public or private, offer. I, I don't, I think, we have to imagine a goal socially where we provide access to the highest level college experiences to people uh, from all backgrounds. And that's a challenge financially, um, but I, I wouldn't want to see us turn the question of educational opportunity into a sort of a digital world and expect that to do uh, to do the job. I just don't think it will. If you think about some of these other values that you've all been talking about of the college educational experience, you know, learning to work with people who are different than you, understanding their perspectives, all of this sort of thing, I'm, I'm not sure the digital experience is going to um, achieve those other goals. It might have some technical uh, capacity building um, aspects to it. Um, also, it tends to work better for, I, we've talked a lot about this at my university, it tends to work better for people who are already um, kind of have a, a baseline of really good training and they have a very specific goal that they want to achieve through this online experience, maybe less well for the person who's just kind of starting out and trying to find their way. The only friendly amendment I might make is that I, um, I'm, Bro's said several times, well, he's glad he's not still in the job. I'm glad I'm not still in the job because I see such a generational difference with respect to the relationship to technology, what they're comfortable with. And I agree that there's something very formative and important about the collegiate experience for young adults. And, and there's so much of that that happens completely apart from courses. But I see the degree to which, I mean, we have our, our students now, after the pandemic, they prefer to do office hours on Zoom at night from home where they don't have this creepy feeling of having to go in and actually see the real professor. Um, so um, it's really interesting. And I just noticed there's um, just the way the workplace has sort of been broken up into pieces and individuals are doing the pieces they want. I think there's a lot going on in, in where higher education is going in technology. I don't think it can replicate the, the sports teams and everything else online, but there is a lot that is already going on um, and a lot from the large publics in terms of the next level degrees, et cetera, but also even the college degree because people need to make it work conveniently and everything else and there are a lot of people who love love interacting with machines more than people. Now that may be create a different kind of problem. <laughs> I do think it's, it can be an equity issue. I think I, I completely agree with, with what's been said. Ideally, humans are social creatures. We learn from each other. So having us close together in dormitories and classrooms and watching how faculty behave, how coaches behave, how other, other uh, students behave make a difference, and you know our ideal around building a brand new dormitory in Portland, for example, and bringing almost 600 new students into the community is retention improves, completion improves, a sense of community improves. It's very important. I will say though that it, it again goes back to equity and access in education. If you're a 33-year-old mother with two kids and you're a single mom and you can only take classes after you put your kids to bed, 
at 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night, and then you have to come down, you're not going to drive to uh, Portland. You're not going to drive to Lewiston. You have to have that access. I do think that the, the online, there's a 1 and there's a 10 in online education. And I think uh, COVID moved a number of our professors closer to the 10 because it wasn't just, here's a bunch of assignments, send them to me, and I'll give you a grade. They started to improve in terms of the interactiveness. And I also think technology, and Google is working on this dramatically, they have really interactive, customized programs that can talk back to you, essentially saying, uh, the graph you're doing doesn't seem to be a, a monopoly curve. Are you missing the marginal revenue line going here, for example? So it teaches you in an interactive way. So it's improving. I'm not saying it's perfect, and, it's, and I completely agree with Renee, it's not for everybody, but I do think when you talk about equity and access, online will play a good and very important role in our future, uh, and it may get a lot better uh, in terms of its interactive abilities to, to move people. Not always ideal in terms of 18 and 20 years old, and I used to say when we were trying to build the dorm and get support for it, there's a lot of reasons why 18-year-olds want to get out of the house, and there's a lot of reasons why parents want them out of the house. So. <laughs>